Hey, it's Mike here, and today a very recent study just came out that looked at various levels in vegans and found that one protein was significantly higher. For the nerds, I'll let you guess. For a hint, it's an important building block of collagen. It's non-essential. It is glycine. You guessed it. You didn't guess it? What, you don't work at Dongwa Jinlong's glycine factory? Are you tired of being cucked by inferior industrial and food grade glycine suppliers? Fear not glycine girlies. Edge yourself down to Dongwa Jinlong. Sorry, that meme is it's like 10 months old, which is equivalent to like 40 internet years. These higher levels prompted a whole more detailed investigation into why, and the results were largely to do with the microbiome, exposing really a greater health risk for the meat eaters, as well as a particular particular strain of bacteria that is involved in all of this. And that strain is connected to bowel disease as well as cancer. So let's just get into the science. Is that my new catchphrase or maybe do better? Let's kick the door down into the science lab. Let's just go. So this is another study that I think is really important because it was on twins. This is another part of the Stanford twin experiment. This is a follow up to that. And that's a situation where they took twins, a bunch of them, and they split them so that one twin was eating a vegan diet and the other one was eating a quote, healthier omnivorous diet. A lot of people have tried to jab at that, but yes, they did eat less processed meat and they did eat more vegetables and less processed foods and sugar in general. And of course, having one twin vegan and the other not makes for some powerful findings and rules out genetics in that sense. So far, there have been multiple studies on this. We have one looking at cardiometabolic markers showing that the LDL or bad cholesterol was better better in the vegan group, for example. And then we also had a follow-up study showing that the epigenetic age markers reversed in the vegan twins only, which is incredible. Also actually lengthening their telomeres, the protective end caps on DNA, which is great. And these are pretty amazing results considering the study was only eight weeks or two months long, but you know, it's a gift that keeps on giving because now we have this new study on the glycine, et cetera, and that is this preprint. So yes, this is a preprint, meaning that it has not been peer reviewed and published in a journal in that sense, but it is the case that this is a team from Stanford that has published in multiple peer reviewed journals before, JAMA, BMC Medicine, and they did that without retraction or changes. So it's unlikely that this is all just some fakey data. Why did they just do a preprint? Sometimes people wanna get data out there faster. Sometimes they wanna save money because it's like three to $5,000 to publish now, which is really frustrating. Um, and I will talk about how these are corroborated results that they have, but let's get to those results, which are that the vegans had a statistically significant higher level of glycine in their blood by about 30%, which was a larger swing than any other protein level. To quote, despite lower glycine intake, vegan diet subjects exhibited elevated serum glycine levels. Yes, they were eating significantly less glycine, and I would actually just say they were eating significantly less in general, which has been a criticism of the study, the lower calorie intake, for example, but that's something that we see over and over again with an increased fiber consumption, which they had also, you know, adopting to a very different diet and people that were just made to go on a vegan diet, like these people didn't choose to do it. They were randomized to it. Yet again, higher blood glycine. And you might be thinking, well, this is a preprint. It could be totally wrong. And to that, I have to say, well, these results have been corroborated by peer reviewed research in the past. For example, this 2022 German study that looked at vegans versus non-vegans and found a comparably higher blood level of glycine. As well as looking back to the older Epic Oxford studies, we can see that the vegans had a higher level of glycine as well. And an interesting finding there is that they also had vegetarians and the vegetarians were closer down there to the glycine levels of meat eaters than they were to the vegans. And we'll talk about why that might be in a second. And you might be wondering why does glycine matter? We'll get to the potential disease risks with the lower amount here in a second, but we can lightning around why glycine is important, what it does in the body. First, again, we have that collagen, a third of the protein in collagen is glycine. And of course that's super important for skin and joint health. And then real fast, it also supports brain function acting as a neurotransmitter, which can balance mood, sleep, et cetera. It aids in detoxification by helping produce glutathione, which is really our body's main self-created antioxidant that we use. And glycine itself also helps regulate metabolism in terms of gluconeogenesis, creating a new sugars, and also helps regulate immune responses among a ton of other things. But now let's get into the why of it, which has to do with a sort of fascinating microbiome situation. Well, they say these high vegan glycine levels were quote, linked to reduced abundance of the gut pathobiont or potentially pathogenic Bilophila wadsworthia. It is a bile loving bacteria that again can be potentially pathogenic that actually 
feeds off of bile, can get energy from it, and we create more bile with more fat, which is why it's heavily associated with higher animal fat intake. It is also specifically associated with animal fat because it likes saturated fat, and it also likes a more acidic environment, two things that go hand in hand with animal product consumption. And this is where we can rewind it back just a second, talking about how those vegetarians were closer to the meat eaters, and that's because they are still eating quite a bit of animal fat, especially saturated animal fat, which is <laughs> mainly from dairy in the US. I'm not a huge fan of using mouse studies, but there's a couple here that I feel like I should mention throughout the video. The first one is one where they looked at the Bilophila wasworthia level in mice, feeding them three different diets, one that was low fat, one that was high unsaturated fat, and one that was high saturated fat. And they found that Bilophila wasworthia levels were almost undetectable in mice on a low fat or unsaturated fat diet, but the bacteria made up about 6% of all gut bacteria in mice fed a high milk fat diet. We have high fat diets leading to higher bile acid production and then the Bilophila wasworthia eating that bile acid in particular. It likes glycine conjugated bile acids. What it does is it takes that glycine, it uses an enzyme to clip it into acetate and then it uses the acetate for fuel. And I couldn't help but wonder why would glycine help with bile acids? Well, these bile acids with glycine appear to be less toxic, more water soluble and more easily recycled. So that's just a biological advantage. And so the study on the twins went further and they looked at the Bilophila wadsworthia levels in the gut of the participants, the vegan versus the meat eating twins and found that the vegans were 50% lower in their Bilophila wadsworthia the uh, content. And for an additional little piece of proof here, we have the enzyme that the Bilophila wadsworthia uses to break that glycine down, it's glycine reductase, and the levels of that in vegans was much lower as well, so the Bilophila wadsworthia wasn't breaking down their glycine, which of course allows it to be reabsorbed and increases those glycine levels in the blood. But once again, we can ask, is this just some crappy fluke from some preprint that isn't peer reviewed that's all gonna be taken down? Well, we can say once again that this is a verified finding from a really recent study looking at the gut microbiome tests of 20,000 people, including vegans. I did a whole video on this. Bilophila wasworthia was also lower in the vegans there as well. And it is also the case that we have several lines of evidence showing that vegans are lower in bile acids. They're eating less animal fat and probably a bit less fat in general. And we can look to the same German researchers that I mentioned before, they did another study on the same people finding that yes, their fecal bile acid levels were much lower as well in the vegan group. Really from this chart, we're talking about like two thirds lower levels of bile acids in the poop. And while they didn't just look at glycine in particular, they did look at blood levels of glycine conjugated bile acids and found that they were higher in the vegans as well. Once again, showing higher blood glycine. And again, supporting the idea that these bile acids with glycine were not being broken down by Bilophila wadsworthia. And another piece of information supporting this just outside of a vegan context is just when you look at native Africans, their fecal bile acids are over three times lower than their African-American counterparts, who of course have similar genetics. And we have several lines of evidence that higher Bilophila wasworthia is worse for your health, especially gut health, and lower is better. And the preprint also had a mouse study component, clearly not done by ethical vegans. And they found that lowering the Bilophila wasworthia content of the mice also increased their glycine blood levels and made them healthier, actually lowering their LDL slash bad cholesterol, which we'll get to in a little bit here. Conversely, if you take mice that are already being fed a high fat diet and you give them some Bilophila wadsworthia, then they end up getting increased inflammation, worse glucose control, etc. And one really not good byproduct of Bilophila wadsworthia's metabolism in general is that hydrogen sulfide, which actually comes through as distinct black dots under the microscope. It's like you can literally see the toxins. Clearly you don't want this stuff. Anyway, hydrogen sulfide is responsible for that rotten egg smell that I'm sure you're familiar with, and it does damaged in quite a few ways. One way in particular, which was interesting, is that it messes up the butyrate metabolism in your gut, and that is a fuel for your gut lining cells, and therefore it can starve those cells of energy and lead to intestinal permeability, AKA, a leaky gut. High levels of Bilophila wadsworthia are also associated with inflammatory bowel disease, and that's likely because that hydrogen sulfide can just directly cause oxidative stress and damage to your DNA potentially if it gets bad enough on the lining of your colon, and of course that is also where the colon cancer risk comes in. And then there's one more reason that I have never heard of before, but doing a deep dive into this I found, and that is that higher hydrogen sulfide can potentially train 
antibiotic resistant bacteria by just creating a higher sulfur environment and getting them used to that because a lot of antibiotics rely on sulfur now, as part of their mechanism for killing bacteria, even penicillin does. So having high levels of bilophila and hydrogen sulfide and sulfur in general is like doing a speed run for training antibiotic or antimicrobial resistance, not good. And don't even get me started on all the antibiotics that we give to farm animals, topic for another time. And then it's also worth tying in the cholesterol connection here as well, which you might've heard me talk about before, but we're talking about bile acids, more or less being modified cholesterol. Our body takes cholesterol from our blood and makes bile acids in our liver. And you can just see the similarity, the base, is the same. And so we have bile acid sequestrant drugs that lower cholesterol by about 20%. However, those can have bad side effects, so they're not as commonly used, but fiber is itself a natural bile acid sequestrant because it binds with bile acids and helps get rid of them and prevents the reabsorption into the blood. And when we have less reabsorbed into the blood, then our body needs to use the cholesterol that's in our blood to create more bile acids and then lowers our cholesterol level. And this is very likely one of the mechanisms by which vegans have that really nice, really ideal LDL or bad cholesterol level from various studies. In the end, it appears that vegans are glycine champions. Yes, from this recent study, 30% higher and corroborated by multiple other studies as well. And again, that is from not eating a high saturated fat, high animal fat diet, leading us to creating less bile acids and not having just this crazy amount of food for Bilophila wadsworthia, and it just eating up all that glycine, breaking it down into acetate so we can't even use it. An ass like another Tate I know, Andrew. So we get a two part benefit here. One, not having that high level of Bilophila wadsworthia, creating all that rotten, eggy, hydrogen sulfide crap that leads to inflammatory bowel disease and colorectal cancer. And then also having that higher glycine level and potentially fueling more collagen production, which is awesome. As well as all those other metabolic benefits and antioxidant benefits like glutathione, immune benefits, and on and on. Anyway, of course, let me know down below what you think about this. And you're welcome to like the video if you learned a single thing. That's a challenge. Did you learn something? I think you did. And of course, you're welcome to subscribe. Who would have thought? You can click that notification bell too. And of course, I will see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.